Okay, <clears throat> everybody. Um, uh, I'm uh, Tom Kane. I'm uh, uh, faculty director of the Center for Education Policy Research. Welcome to the spring semester of the uh, Partners in Education Research um, Research Seminar. Um, uh, last week, um, we learned that Peter Bergman from uh, Columbia, who was originally scheduled to present, um, let us know that he wasn't able to present. And of course, we were uh, panicked. And we're lucky <laughs> to find Eric Taylor, who was willing to, who had a paper he was excited about presenting, who was willing to, um, to you know, fill in the gap for us um, on, on short notice. So Eric, as you know, is a faculty member here at the uh, Harvard Grad School of Education has been doing a series of studies on just how teacher evaluation policies change life uh, within schools, either by you know, providing feedback that is helpful to teachers to improve, but um, uh, also um, uh, studying in, in the paper he'll be presenting today on how the information from uh, teacher evaluations could potentially distort um, uh, teaching uh, behavior. So, um, so Eric, uh, um, let's welcome Eric and thank him for for uh, being willing to to jump into the breach and you know uh, save the seminar today. <laughs> yeah, that last moment got really high stakes when you said yeah. save the seminar. Uh, so thank you for having me. It's really fun to sort of be playing on the home court. We don't get that opportunity as academics very often. Um, so I'm not supposed to turn it on. I think it's just on for the video. But I will increase my volume for the joke, which is that um, <laughs> I can get in this building whenever I want, and I come and present my research here sometimes late at night, but it's nice to have a room full of people. <laughs> to give the talk to. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about uh, teacher evaluation. This is joint work with my co-authors Esteban Acejo and Teresa Romano. And uh, some of the things that I've written about teacher evaluation are sort of optimistic, uh, or mostly optimistic, in that they show improvements in teacher performance as a result of the process of being evaluated. This, uh, this paper certainly has some, some pessimistic hinges, but we'll hope to get to the optimistic parts of it as well. So what I'm going to show you is evidence that, uh, at least in one place at a particular time, teachers treated uh, two groups of students differently. The students were otherwise identical, but they treated them differently because of differences in the incentives that were uh, sort of implied by the adults performance evaluation system. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today. And sort of in jargony terms, we call that sort of distorting teacher effort and decisions. This is a long standing sort of topic in economics, in labor economics generally, and in the economics of education. So for a long time, we've been worried about how worker effort and decisions respond to evaluation of which this is one particular example. We're particularly worried about that in jobs that uh, in economics we call multitask jobs, right? So that um, someone has lot, several different things that we're hoping they will accomplish in the course of their professional responsibilities. And the reason that evaluation is a particular concern in multitask jobs is that often performance evaluation measures end up emphasizing some of those tasks and not others. So that I have some incentive to focus on the things that are measured and not on the things about my job that are not measured. So the sort of seminal paper in economics about this problem is the Holstrom and Milgram paper. And in fact, the example that they give in that theoretical paper is about teachers. So they focus on, uh, uh, they talk about a problem where some skills that we want teachers to teach kids lots of skills. This will sound very familiar to people in this room. We want teachers to teach lots of skills. Some of those skills are easier to measure on standardized tests than others are not. And so when we place 
uh, performance evaluation weight on the standardized test scores, we encourage teachers to focus on the things that are testable uh, at the expense of things that are not testable. So there's lots of other ways in which there might be multitask distortion in schools. We just talked about you know, distortion across subjects or topics, and there's in fact some empirical evidence that suggests that that uh, does happen. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a different dimension of teachers' tasks. Instead of thinking about different subjects that they have to teach, what I want you to have in mind is the different students that they're assigned are different tasks. Uh, and we're going to show you a case where the incentives for one student are different from the incentives for another student, but those students are otherwise identical. There's a great paper by uh, Derek Neal and Diane Schonsenbach that's closest to our work here that shows something uh, that has sort of entered the lexicon of education research as the bubble kids, right? That when we have no child left behind style performance evaluation systems uh, that are based on the proportion of kids who pass an exam, that that encourages teachers and schools to focus on kids who are near that threshold for passing and failing. So I think what's different about our paper and the Neil and Schonsenbach paper is, and others that are like it, uh, is that in the case of the Neil and Schonsenbach paper and the general incentives of No Child Left Behind, that was partly intentional, right? That was part of what was intended by the policy makers uh, in setting up the incentives in No Child Left Behind. Anyway, there are others. I will skip in the interest of time a really interesting paper about sort of teachers shifting across uh, time within students, shifting their effort across time within students. But if you like this, that's a great one to read. All right, so what do we do in this paper? We're going to study a short-lived change in North Carolina's evaluation rules. So what was that change? Well, let me tell you first uh, what, what the, before we get to the change, we should state for the record that in North Carolina, this will be familiar to most people in this room, teachers and schools are evaluated based on their students' annual end of grade test scores in grades three through eight. Besides the federal no child left behind policies that were in place in the period that we're studying here, North Carolina also has a state policy that evaluates teachers and schools based on test scores. So what we study is a policy that persisted for just four years, from 2009 to 2012. That's what I'm going to call the retest policy. And under that policy, students who failed the test, the initial end of grade test, were then retested two to three weeks later. And importantly, only the higher of their initial test score and their retest score counted for the adults' performance evaluation, right? So the no child left behind proportion of kids passing was based on the max of initial score and retest score. So but this is not really, uh, we don't think of this as a paper about retesting per se. We think about it as a paper about incentives. So the retest policy that I just described leads to new incentives for teachers, right? which differ sharply across students in this particular way. Any effort that the teachers and schools give to the retested students can only improve their performance measure, right? Because it's the max of their initial score and their retest score. Any effort that's given to non-retested students will not change their evaluation score at all because their score is already in the books. So, Despite that, that sharp difference in incentives, for kids who are very close to the boundary of passing and failing the exam, those kids are educationally identical, right? They would have the same, they would get the same benefit from the effort of their teachers. They would have, they have the same sort of claim on that effort. Any welfare function that you have at social welfare function that you have in mind, those kids would have the same weight in that welfare function. And yet they have different uh, different incentives for the teacher's effort. So I'm going to show you that uh, the outcomes were, were different for these kids. Tom. So Eric, I, I know later you're, you're going to um, show some research where, or show some evidence where you think it's not just the students 
like responding to, to the incentives. Yeah. But but what are the student incentives here? So so when you when you just when you describe that students are failing, does that mean yeah. that they're at <clears throat> risk of repeating the grade? Yeah. Like what are the consequences for for the student? Yeah. So I mean, uh, there are sort of all of the hard to define consequences for students of you know uh, the signal that they get from uh, from how they perform on an end of year test, right? But in terms of district and state policies, kids who fail the test are nominally at higher risk of being asked to repeat the grade. I'm going to show you that, that that's true, but not very many people repeat in math as a result of their math test score. And that, that policy didn't change at the same time that uh, this policy that we tested has changed, which is going to be part of our identification strategy. So I'll definitely come back to that. All right. So what are the econometrics here? So our identification strategy combines elements of difference in differences and event studies uh, on the one hand and regression discontinuity on the other hand. So let's start with the regression discontinuity part. So we're going to, first you can think about us comparing kids who are barely above and below the cutoff to pass the exam in the way that we do in regression discontinuity. Think of that regression discontinuity, that running variable happening in year T. Then we're going to compare our outcome variable is going to be their math scores one calendar year later at T plus one. That's the first time that we observe everybody again being tested. Some of the kids are retested, but we need to have tests for all of them. Then once we have, we're going to do that RD estimate each school year. And I'm not going to show you a plot over time of those RD estimates before, during, and after this policy occurred. And the main result is that the retest policy improved students' test scores by three one hundredths of a standard deviation. And I'm going to argue and hopefully convince you in this presentation or, or by reading the paper that, te that the mechanism for that improvement was that teachers gave more effort during the two to three weeks between the initial test and the retest and that as a result, students learned more. Okay. Um, so Tom set a good example by asking a question already. And that's my sort of wind up, but you should ask questions that you have too, including at this very moment. Uh, otherwise, I will tell you more details about the empirical setting and the treatments that are going on here. Peter. So we should think about that as kind of like the first stage effect, right? Like over the three weeks between the first test and the second test, you get this like additional learning of like 0.03. And then you're going to look at how does that then translate into subsequent achievement. No, we can have a conversation about that a little bit later on. But I'm, the reason this is the closest thing we have uh, is that, you know, at time t, some kids pass, some kids fail. The kids who pass aren't tested again until t plus 1. So that's the first time that I can observe uh, outcomes for the comparison group. Oh, I see. So this point oh three, this is like math scores in T plus one. Yeah, oh, right. That's right. Okay, got it. Right. So the instantaneous effect is probably larger than point oh three if you believe that there is some decay in treatment effects. But we can have that conversation later. So let me let me ask a really yeah. question. So how much like how much do the students who get like what's kind of like the effect of that additional three weeks on the students like test scores in kind of like the first stage in a sense, right? Like oh we have a measure like that learning. I mean I think it's probably about 0.06 for reasons that I can explain. Okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is for kids at the margin, so you can't detect any triage effects from students lower in the distribution? Uh yeah, no. My inference here is regression discontinuity inference. It is kids at the cutoff for passing and failing. can't tell if it's zero sum in some way for kids lower. How would it be zero sum? Uh, who, is, who is losing? So kids lower in the distribution are losing, right? Because this is at the margin. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, or kids higher in the distribution right, are losing. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Descriptively, how? You're not Mary Waxman. 
I know. Um, how many uh, students who retest um, end up passing only in that second? Okay, in that second. Sixty uh, percent. Well, at the mar at the in our population of inference, the uh, in the late as best as we can tell, sixty percent. And what do you do with the kids who do repeat the grade? Um, we leave them in. If we throw, there are very few of them. If we throw them out, the the estimates are no different. But I'm not, just to be clear, I'm not going to use the retest scores at all except in one specific place in the paper where I will point it out. Right. Okay, so uh, the data that we have spanned from 2003 to 2016. During that entire period of time, students were tested annually in grades 3 through 8. During that entire period of time, there was some form of no child left behind, which you uh, in this room are familiar with. Schools and teachers are evaluated based on the proportion of their kids who pass the test. So that's the same margin that we're going to be exploiting in the regression discontinuity. Also in North Carolina, there's a state policy which pre-existed No Child Left Behind. It's called the ABCs. That includes a No Child Left Behind proportion passing measure. It also includes a growth measure. Actually, incidentally, North Carolina, for a period of time, had a waiver under No Child Left Behind to include growth in their No Child Left Behind. Basically, there's a lot of performance measures in no, no, North Carolina that are based on how students perform on these grades 3 through 8 tests. And that happened throughout uh, 2003 to 2016. During the retest years, 2009 to 2012, these, this is what was different. Students who failed the initial test were retested two to three weeks later, and only the max of their initial score. And their retest score counted for No Child Left Behind and ABC's performance measures. Uh, Andrew looks. No, I'm just why? Why did they turn it off and turn it on? <laughs> uh, well, um, why did they turn it on? Because more kids passed. Uh, it can only be that more kids passed. I don't know. I don't know why they turn it on. Why do they turn it off? Because around that time, uh, No Child Left Behind starts to get sort of undone um, and eventually replaced. OK. What else? So the heart of this is a regression discontinuity. So let's think for just a moment about uh, what might be discontinuous at that cutoff. So we're going to be using kids who are just above and below the passing margin, which is also called level two and level three, which is also called proficient and non-proficient. All of those things are the same thing. I'm just going to use the phrase pass and not pass or fail. What gets assigned discontinuously at that cutoff? Well, being retested during the period. Uh, interventions that are linked to retesting, like being given extra instruction in math, but also potentially other interventions like next year's peers or next year's teachers. Right? This is a consequential cutoff uh, being you know, retained in grade. There are other things that are potentially discontinuous. That's why we need the, uh, the, the difference in a regression discontinuity identification strategy rather than just regression discontinuity. And just to emphasize it, right? test at time t happens in May. Our outcome, that's our running variable. The outcome variable is the test one year later. The retest is happening two or three weeks later, which is like five or 10% of instruction days later. I was just thinking, do you have, when you say two or three weeks, are there some places where you know it's two, some mm -hmm. grades where you know it's two, some yeah. grades where you know it's three? Actually, the thing that makes it different is school's choices. And uh, if we have time, I will show you that schools' choices about when to give the test uh, respond to the incentives of this policy as well. When do teachers find out which of their students are going to retest? Uh, like almost immediately. My understanding is that uh, like, like if the tests are on a Thursday or Friday, they know by the next Monday. Yeah. Um, is retesting associated with um, any kind of interventions? following school year, um, like math, remedial math? Oh, explicitly no, but, um, but you know, failing the exam, I'm going to show you evidence that it is associated with getting different peers and different teachers. Yes. But not just because they were retested, because they failed. 
In thinking about sort of picking up on Tom's question about the incidents of student space, are you able at all to see if students are just thinking, man, it really stuck to have to take the test twice, so I'm going to try harder yep. next year? Yep, I'm going to come back to that. Obviously, we don't have any measures of what they're thinking, but I'm going to show you some evidence that rules out that possible explanation. Okay, or pretty, I think, convincing rules out that possible explanation. All right, so I'm going to show you the main estimates now. Um, and because both event study, diff and diff style designs, and RD designs are very visual, I'm going to start with pictures, which are themselves the, basically the results. So here is um, uh, an event study of regression discontinuity estimates. So each point that you see here is itself an RD estimate from 2003 to 2015. My co-author said we should like mark off the years of the policy, but I think you can see them. <laughs> um, those four points that are clearly above the line are the years of the policy. This is the sort of conventional regression discontinuity graph. Sorry. Over Sorry. how many schools is this happening? The whole state. Uh, and I'm not remembering what the number okay. is. It's somewhere in the paper. <laughs> Here. So like after the policy is turned off, it seems to, is that like a persistent like negative? Oh, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, can I, can I come back? Yeah, oh, well, punt. Yeah. No, 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 punt, punt. It's fine. It's fine. There's something else changed in the way that North Carolina did testing at this point, uh, which I will sort of gloss over the details of what. We're taking a conservative approach here. If we take a, if we took the, take the alternative approach, these points are higher up and include zero. So, also like we could just throw out these years if you thought they were problematic for other reasons, and we get this. You know, I don't think that they're problematic. I mean, like it could also be that you know teachers were used to having this program that like allowed them to have like a better evaluation. You take away the program, yeah. and there's some hysteresis because there's kind of like they're pissed, right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, That's what I was thinking. That is the, the, that is the first non-threat to identification explanation for me. <laughs> um, okay. So that's the sort of event. So I guess the main results of the paper here is the sort of con traditional RD graph just to show you that we're not trying to hide anything here. This is an RD where the running variable is, is a test score and the outcome variable is a test score in the same testing regime. So these things are highly correlated, right? So, um, and the treatment effects are not not big. So, but you can see it if we zoom in. Here are the years of the the retest policy, uh, and here are the years that are not the retest policy. So, uh, to show what we're going to do mathematically, we're going to take those that event study and turn it into a difference in RD estimates, one point estimate. This regression specification should look like a combination of regression discontinuity and difference and differences. So we're going to fit this thing by local linear regression. F is going to be a, our, our you know, local function of the running variable. B is an indicator for failing the initial test. So that's what you would see in a regression discontinuity, a function of the running variable and an indicator for failing. R is an indicator variable for the retest years, and B times R <coughs> is our difference in differences estimate, so the delta is what we're after. It's how the regression discontinuity estimate is different in the period of the policy from what it was in the period outside the policy. So, you know, back to our picture, we're going to calculate the average of the blue dots and subtract off the average of the red dots. That's the, in, in you know, intuitive terms, that's the estimate of delta. So the difference in regression discontinuity estimate. Okay, here is that estimate. Let me just describe the estimate and what these tables look like, because I'm gonna show you other estimates that are in the same format. Okay, so here is our estimate of delta in column two. In column one, what we have is the RD estimate for the, um, uh, for the non-retest years. So this is the difference at the cutoff in test scores 
during the non outside of those four special years. And this is uh, the RD estimate in those four years minus this number. Go ahead. Sorry, I just, you had a note about the bandwidth, and I was just yep. curious what that meant. Sorry, uh, like, means, not what the bandwidth, but like all level two, and is that your bandwidth is included? Is, we include everybody in level two and level three. Okay. And the reason, you know, the reason why I'm a little bit self-conscious that lots of people in the room are either my current students in S290 or former students, and so I'm like practicing what I preach here. Um, but one of the reasons why that bandwidth is not crazy is that these relationships are so linear, right? Um, we, we pick up a lot of precision, but actually the point estimates are no different if we shrink, shrink the bandwidth all the way down to a quarter of that bandwidth. Which I can show you. Right here. So here are our alternative bandwidths. A quarter, a half, or three quarters of the bandwidth in the main estimates. And our point estimates don't really change at all. 0 0.03, 0 0.03, 0 0.03. Eric, like, I guess you could argue that it gives you like a very policy relevant belief, right? Because you can really talk like the like who the marginal group is when we think about the in a sense kind of like how far we should take the external validity of the estimates as well. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, the 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 inference is to the people at the cutoff. I'm just saying uh, I'm not giving up. You know, I'm not I'm not giving up concerns about bias in favor of inference in a significant way here just because it's it's super. Yeah. Linear. But our inference is still the people just right at the cutoff. Tom. Um, so, Eric, so you're going to tell a story that it was during these two or three weeks after, yeah. after the first exam that the teacher is really going to focus on those kids who failed. Yeah. So, like, wouldn't another way to a, another specification? to test would be if I'm the only kid in the class that failed, I'm yeah. getting yeah. that teacher's undivided attention during those two or three weeks. Yeah. But if I'm if I'm in a class where, you know, two thirds of the kids, yeah. you know, failed, that teacher's time is being divided by, you know, a much yeah. larger number. So like it gives sort of a natural way to sort of scale the, like, if it really is sort of an effort thing, like, could you, you know, interact it with the proportion of kids in the class that had failed? Yeah. And we've tried things in that neighborhood, uh, but we should probably go back and, and think about it some more. There is a little bit of that in the, in the, in the existing paper, but it's sort of like well down the road. But like even yeah. if you just did in the extreme, like say if you're yeah. one or if you're the only kid right. or like if you're one or two kids. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, there's something here that nobody has raised yet, which is that you're letting me play fast and loose with the notion of schools and teachers. Right? So I haven't you haven't made pinned me down on whether this is individual evaluation or team evaluation. Mm -hmm. I think whether or not it's individual or team evaluation the sort of logic carries through. But if it is team evaluation, then you open up strategies like take all the kids who need to be retested. Even if there's one or two in each class, you can take all the kids who need to be retested, put them in a like, these kids are going to be retested class, give them the best math teacher uh, during those period of time. So we're, we're shifting decisions and effort uh, choices across teachers in a team evaluation environment there. But, do you, do you have any situation where teachers continue on with the students? Oh, uh, sometimes people use the jargon looping, like I'm your same teacher for fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. No, I don't think so, but I've never looked. Do you have a thought about I mean, like those teachers you'd imagine have like better information. And so like if there's any kind of like targeting or tracking, it would be interesting to see the yeah. magnitude of the estimates are greater or lower. And that could yeah. potentially respond to Andrew's point about the welfare implications, right? 
Because you might say, like, here's this kid, I invested a little bit more extra time, yeah. and they really showed me that. They kind of, like, exceeded expectations a ton, yeah. and then my prior and then could be, like, sufficiently revised yeah. um, in, the, in, in the subsequent yeah. year. And then that could we, be yeah. a third point. Yeah, we can look at, uh, I, my guess is if North Carolina is like the rest of the country, that, that's actually pretty rare, that, that, okay. that kind of arrangement, but yeah. So was there some cutoff for performance where you get like an A grade versus a yeah. B grade? As yeah. So oh, not in, uh, no, not in the way that like Florida and other places do, at least I don't think that works. So it's just some continuous, like, where do like consequences kick in for the school or for the teacher? There's all the no child left behind consequences, right? If you, like, they're very complex, but uh, hopefully we <coughs> listen to remember them. Basically like, if you fail to meet adequate yearly progress, if your proportion passing doesn't go up at the right rate in sequential years, the consequences keep getting worse to the point where like your school, everybody, all the adults in the school get fired. You know, in practice that didn't happen very often. So I'm just wondering, like, if they have a sense after the first testing whether or not they're safe, whether that's at a school level or at an individual yeah, yeah. level, and so then we you might respond to... differentially, yeah. like, oh, I'm just right. below the cutoff, I really better kick it in, or I'm above yeah. the cutoff. Right. right, so we've looked to see whether the treatment effects are heterogeneous by the proportion of kids in the school who are passing or failing. Uh, it, it, they don't appear to be, if anything, like maybe the schools who are already high performing are exploiting this margin more. But I can't, I can't uh, reject that, the opposite of that hypothesis. Uh, that would be consistent with the scaling story I was telling. Maybe, yeah. That like if there are relatively few kids in the school failing, yeah. then they can really use that two or three week period to really concentrate on them. Yeah. These are also schools who are doing good at teaching kids math before, right? Yeah. But maybe some of it is, is scale. Um, so. I was just wondering if you had estimated the like treatment of the variance across sites, like instead of like getting to each oh, one, just like no. opening how much there was. We have not estimated that. No. Um, all right. Again, I'm a little self-conscious. I want to like do a good job for my students. <coughs> talk about identifying assumptions. These, this has been in the slides forever. Uh, this is not me. Um, all right, we need the regular old uh, RD assumptions that there's continuity of potential outcomes at the pass-fail cutoff. So in the table, we do all the sort of standard talking and uh, testing for smoothness of density and smoothness of pretreatment covariates and whatnot. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. It's a well-behaved regression discontinuity. We also need a second assumption, which is sort of a cousin to the parallel trends assumption from difference in differences. And that assumption is that we need to believe that the RD estimate from the non-retest years would have been true in the retest years absent the policy. So the thing that the trend we saw going on in the pre-period would have, con and it was basically flat, that would have continued on in the in the in the policy years. Those are our identifying assumptions. You know, the strongest evidence for assumption two is that picture I already showed you, that the trend was, was pretty flat. You have to worry about other potential changes in policy that were happening at the same time, and we talk about that in the paper. Um, what about magnitude? Should we care about 0.03? So, first of all, scaled against the total differences in teacher performance, 0.03 is you know 15 to 30 percent of the standard deviation in teacher job performance. So it's a big move. If you think all of the treatment effect is coming through some change in teacher behavior, it's sort of big relative to what we could hope for in changing teacher behavior. Our estimates of adding instruct, uh, or we can compare our estimates to other estimates of adding instructional time, which is a little bit you know, uncomfortable because we're, we're uh, these are very different scales of change, but if we scale those, if I rescale the estimates from other papers to a one week uh, improvement in, in instructional time, we get like 0 0.03, 0 0.02, 0 0.02 for one week. <coughs> and I'm gonna try to convince you that over two to three weeks, 
you can get you know roughly the same kind of improvement. So I think it compares favorably to other estimates, sort of consistent with other estimates. Someone, uh, well, so some of you who study student test scores as outcomes will know that treatment effects on test scores tend to fade out. This is true for just about every treatment that I've seen uh, tested where people test for fade out. So we, I'm trying to convince you that there was some treatment that happened in the two to three weeks after the initial test. But then we don't measure the outcome until one calendar year later, effectively. So during that time, the treatment effect might have faded out. And so if you, if you believe estimates, from, if you want to apply the estimates from other literature to our estimate, then that would imply that the treatment effect at the end of the two to three weeks was about 0.06, because test score effects typically fade out by about half in one calendar year. Two questions. So for assumption two on the previous slide, um, <clears throat> what happens if you like ignore the treatment years and just run the diff and diff as if kind of like the the last set of years were kind of like a treatment year and like test for the difference? Because you almost have like you like a pre-trend and like a post-trend and like test for the difference between like the pre-trend and the and the post-event trend, right? That could be that could be one kind of indirect test of um, assumption two. And test the post years. <clears throat> test whether the post years appear to be in the trend. Yeah, because even though they're they're down from zero, they might still be like in this. The confidence things I think are overlapping. Yeah. The, pre the quote unquote pre trends and the post trends. Yeah, uh, in the very early life of this paper, I think our versions of this table had the post years broken out as well, and we couldn't reject that it was equal to the the pre years. So, but it's been a long time since we did that. But I, I, think, I think that's the answer to your question. And then the second question is, do you have as an outcome whether or not a student that receives this treatment becomes marginal again, or like is a bubble kid in a subsequent year? Do we have an estimate of that here? I think that would be a really interesting outcome too, right? Because it's like, to what extent does this intervention like prevent you being, in a sense, perpetually marginal, right? I have, I've estimated that from data in Florida, uh, and surprisingly not very many kids are marginal two years in a row. So, um, that sounds like we have, I have to get a t-shirt that says perpetually marginal. <laughs> no, I'm just, no, I'm just trying to think of like, because we could think about this as being kind of like a, 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 a treatment effect on the intensive margin. It'd be interesting to see if like, there's a treatment effect on the extensive margin as well, too, right? I mean, if they're getting 0.03, and it's if 0.03 is sticking a year later, they're not marginal anymore. So there is a persistent effect. Two years later, it's it's um, two years later, it's 0.023. So. Which actually is consistent with the patterns of decay in other papers. That's what all this math is about. Um, but uh, you know, so something's sticking. Yeah. So I think this is I think this is a feature, right? Because then what you're saying yeah. is like, one, these kids are like learning more in subsequent years, and two, they're less likely to need retesting, right? And so to the extent yeah. that this retesting is an expensive kind of endeavor, you're both increasing learning. And yeah, I don't know, but yeah. So the question is. <laughs> Peter Blair to plant. Uh, I will now do no, that no, thing. I will now do that thing where, like, I take your comment and completely reorganize it to my own purposes. Um, basically, what you're saying is, well, what was going on here, right? Was it the retesting? Was it something else? Was it about the kids? People have asked about that before. So let's move on then and talk about potential mechanisms and threats. Masterfully done. I mean, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> some some of these things, depending on how you're interpreting the data so far, you will think of them as threats to identification. Uh, some people will think of the exact same thing as a mechanism. So uh, that's why I call them mechanisms and threats, because they might be either. And Eric, not, yeah. not, to, not to belabor, but I think like as a policy outcome, like if, if this program is expensive, like we I would want to know, like, am I also saving money on like not having to retest these kids in the future because we intervened like earlier. 
Yeah, I don't think it's especially a success. Okay. Alright. I mean, they sit for the testing. Okay. Uh, t uh, Andrew can tell us how expensive it is to have extra forms of the test, but my guess is they use the same forms in different places, so that, like, kids in Charlotte who get retested are just using the form that was used in Raleigh. Okay, potential mechanisms and threats. The first thing that I want to say about mechanisms and threat is I think the most useful empirical detail for ruling in and out potential mechanisms in this paper. And I've been lying to you so far, but only a tiny little bit, okay? Uh, but now I'm gonna stop lying to you. So it actually is the case that there was some retesting happening before 2009, before this policy started, but it was limited. Okay, so one thing is that that retesting was mechanically similar to the retesting that I've been telling you about. Kids took the test at the end of the year, Students who failed were retested two to three weeks later. But it was much more limited in scope. First of all, it only happened in grades three, five, and eight, and only in about a third of districts. Districts had some choice over whether or not they, they did this. But only in certain grades. So for those <coughs> districts and grades, when the new policy comes along in 2009, the only thing that changes is whether or not the retest scores count for the adults. The kids have been retested before. They're still retested now. The only thing that changes in that, in those particular places, is the stakes for the adults. So it's a sort of even cleaner and sharper difference, but it's in this limited place. So turns out our estimates are no different for that limited sample. Let me show you those now. That's the top row of this table, which has a whole bunch of words that mean more in the, in the context of the paper, but basically these are the grades three, five, and eight in districts where, uh, where they were doing retesting before this policy started. And our point estimate there is 0.034, essentially the same. In fact, in the other grades where retesting wasn't happening anywhere, our point estimates are pretty similar. In districts, in grade three, five, and eight, in districts that didn't do this retesting, our point estimates are pretty similar. So it doesn't seem to be anything about the kids themselves being retested, but rather about the stakes for the adults, the incentives for the adults. When you use that in a couple of places to answer your question, uh, about other potential mechanisms. So if this, if you have questions about this, let me know. Sorry if I missed this. Is this like reading or math? Or is oh, so far I've been showing you only results for math. Okay. And are there results for reading? <laughs> the result for reading is positive, but much smaller and not statistically significant. So there are there are some theoretical reasons to think that it might be smaller, right? So one hypothesis about why it's often the case that treatments affect reading less than math, especially treatments that are targeted towards improving teaching. And one hypothesis for that is that the return on marginal teacher effort in reading is smaller than in math. Why? You learn a lot of reading at home you don't learn a whole lot. On average, the typical kid doesn't learn a whole, a whole lot of math at home, and so actually teacher effort at the margin is most valuable in math. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about here is marginal teacher effort. We would expect under that hypothesis for the treatment of X to be smaller. There are also some econometric reasons why we focus on math. Uh, most importantly, like we can't do, Tried to be fancy with links and stuff, and then I. All right, uh, we can't do this kind of test in reading. So, we think this is helpful to the argument of the paper, but we can't do it in reading. All right. So, back to where we were at on the main path. I told you that I think this particular result is really helpful because it rules out. Uh, explanations that have to do with kids themselves. Rules out other potential explanations too. 
but let's just state out loud what those potential explanations about kids are. So there is a whole class of potential mechanisms that do not rely at all on changes in teacher or school effort. So one type is that this policy uh, of retesting may have changed student or family effort independent of the teachers. So one example is, you know, students might be retested and they might say to themselves, I'm being retested, I'm clearly not doing something right, I need to try harder. They try harder the next year, they score higher the next year. Another example is, you know, students are retested, they hate that experience, you have to miss out on other fun things, you have to take a test again, and so therefore, the next year comes along, I haven't learned anything new, but I remember that being retested was not very fun, so I try harder on the day of the test, uh, and my score is higher. Nobody has raised this last one yet, but often it comes up that it's possible that students simply by sitting for a second test develop better skills at test taking. They just, be, they just get better at taking tests because they've taken more tests. They've seen more items. All right, all of those are things that would uh, potentially improve students' test scores one year later that have nothing to do with teachers or schools or could have nothing to do with teachers or schools. But of course, the strongest argument against any of these is what, uh, or at least the strongest argument we have in the paper empirically is the one I just showed you, that in places where students were being retested already, there was no treatment effect until the incentives for the adults changed, until, until the performance evaluation for the adults changed. So none of these things were happening before the policy started, even though students were being retested. Uh, we can look at some, some relatively direct measures of, of student effort, uh, like absences the following year. So if you think kids are going to try harder the following year, you might also think that they would show up to school more, but there's no effect on, on absence, no statistically significant effect. Um, you know, one one hundredth of a day fewer absences, or something like that. Not very much. If you thought that they were, they said to themselves, "Oh, I don't like being retested. I need to try harder on tests," and that bled over into other tests. You might think that we would see an effect of math retesting on reading test scores. And we don't see anything uh, anywhere near the same magnitude of what we see in math, though it is, you know, it has a p-value that's less than 0.1. I will let you update your priors as you see fit uh, on, on that dimension. It doesn't look like kids gave much effort um, when we can directly observe it. Um, in other ways. Yeah. Does being retested in real Mary? Real Mary, yes. Uh, does being retested in reading affect math similarly? Oh, uh, I've never looked. <clears throat> okay, so that's potential explanations or threats. <clears throat> that are about the kids and, by extension, their families. Now I want to switch and think about mechanisms for changes in what the schools, the teachers and schools are doing, but in the subsequent school year, after the retest has already happened, right? Because again, I want to, you know, in the end, my own, my own conclusion is that it's something about what happened in the two to three weeks between the test and the retest. Part of the reason I'm, I'm personally convinced of that is that I'm going to try to rule out mechanisms that might happen after the retest during the subsequent school year, but before we measure outcomes, right? With me? Okay. So, you know, for example, it's plausible. I've seen this in other places. It's quite plausible that uh, teacher and peer assignments or even tracking or even the level of course that kids get assigned to or grade retention as Tom mentioned already. It's, it's possible that all those things differ discontinuously at the pass-fail cutoff for the end of year test. 
Sometimes there's explicit policies. In fact, in North Carolina, there is an, there was an explicit policy about grade retention. I want to be very clear about what that policy was. The policy was that if a student failed, that that failure had to be one factor that was used in the decision about whether or not the student should be retained in grade. That policy existed, you know, before the before the policy we're testing here, it existed after. It also turns out that it can't be, practically, it can't be that failing the test forces you to be retained in grade because a ton of kids fail the test. There's no way that the state could retain all those kids in grade. And actually, it's much more likely that the test affects your retention in reading because people tend to, to first think about retaining kids based on reading before they think about math. So, there just empirically wasn't much retention difference at the cutoff, but I'll show you the estimate of what it was in a second. So there are all those potential things that might be happening in the subsequent school year, but for our purposes, we have the benefit of, for in our identification strategy, of this difference in RD. So for, for these things to threaten our identification, the discontinuities in these things would need to be new or larger or smaller in 2009 to 2012. Something about those discontinuities would have had to change too. So let me show you some examples. So one is, well, let's do retained in grade. So uh, barely failing the exam does increase the probability that you're retained in grade, but that relationship is not any different during the four retest policy year. So it's not a threat to our identification. The same basic story holds for, you know, if you barely fail, you get a slightly better teacher, uh, you get slightly better peers. If you failed last year, you get slightly better peers this year. But those relationships, even though there are discontinuities at the pass-fail cutoff, uh, those relationships don't change during the, the four policy years that we're All right. Another set of results that I think is helpful in thinking about when the treatment uh, was occurring is sort of follows from this intuition. I think, why would it be that uh, kids have differential, there's a policy about retesting, but there's no policy about the quality of your peers or the quality of your teacher or, the, or tracking. So why would it be that kids who barely failed have different peers or different teachers? You know, you have to have in mind some, um, some, story where uh, people ascribe to just having fail stamped on your forehead means that you deserve something different. Even though your test score is, is only epsilon different from a kid who passed. So one thing that is empirically useful for us is that all of these kids who were treated were retested again uh, a couple of weeks later and the majority of them passed on that retest. So if they had been stamped on the forehead with fail, failing student, to some degree that stamp would have been, you know, taken off or overridden to some extent because for most of them, because most of them passed. I'll show you those numbers in a second. Uh, it's also, well, let me come back to that. All right, so what, this is a new structure of table. So what's going on here? Each row in this table is a set of students. The first row is students who were one scale score point below the cutoff at time t. So they only missed passing the exam by one scale score point, right? Those students are closest to the, uh, the population to which we can make inferences in regression discontinuity, right? They're right there at the cutoff. Then I'm also showing you Students who were two scale score points, three, four, five. In the paper, we go all the way down. 
But what do you notice about those students? Well, first, uh, what I want you to notice is, as I said before, that most of them actually pass the exam uh, when, they re when they retake it, 60%. Most of them are passing, which is going to mute any sort of um, labeling effect of having failed the exam. It's also the case that and this is sort of subtle, so I want to uh, make sure I explain it clearly. It's also the case that barely failing the retest versus barely passing the retest doesn't have any effect on future test scores for these kids. All right. So what is the negative 0 0.001 point estimate there? There we're doing, we, we take all, only the kids who missed the cutoff by one scale score point. That's our sample. And using that sample, we do a regression discontinuity estimate uh, of barely failing the retest on test scores, you know, at time t plus one. There's no effect there. So if some, you know, also there's no incentive there for the adults, right? At that point, the performance evaluation measures are in the books. There's nothing the adults can do. Uh, and in fact, there's no difference for the kids who barely take it. Yeah. There's a question about the scale. How should we think about that? Is that like out of 100, or is it like SAT or ACC? Oh, units. Sorry. This is standard deviation. Oh. Column one? No, column, column one. one, yeah. Column one is scale score. So that's what, that's what uh, you know, you take individual items, you either are correct or incorrect. The psychometricians tell us what the weights should be. We take a weighted average of the individual items with, the, with those weights. And then that average, that weighted average, we turn into scale score points. How many, how many scale score points in an SD? In a, in a whole standard deviation. That, that depends. It's just, I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Do you, have this, do you have this table for um, before the policy change was implemented? So when the students were retaking the, the tests, those who were close to the cutoff score um, do equally proportionally as well as those who uh, get to under this regime? Yeah, I don't have the <coughs> table, but we can do it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, I have time. Um, let me now now for something completely different. Same policy, same general question, but a different set of data. So um, I'm going to convince you, hopefully, in the next couple of minutes, that uh, of a different change in the behavior of the adults, uh, namely that they changed their test dates behavior in response to the retest policy. This gets back to, I think, something Tom was asking about. So I've been telling you this whole way along that, like, you know, the retesting happened two to three weeks later. Why is there any uncertainty in that? So it's the case that in the state of North Carolina, at least, and actually this is true lots of places, the state sets what they call a testing window. So they say you have to have you have to give your kids the end of your test between this date and this date. But, dear district, dear school, you can choose which date you want to actually give the test off. So, thinking about you know, changes in behavior in response to evaluation, we come up with, you know, skipping over lots of details, we come up with this prediction, which I think is relatively Intuitive, and that is schools, you know, think about the following prediction. Schools will choose their date for the initial test late in the window in the absence of the policy, but early in the window with the policy. Why? Because in the absence of the retesting policy, choosing a late date gives you the most amount of time before the kid is retested. Once the policy starts, though, 
you should choose a day early in the window because then you've identified the kids who will be retested and you can focus on them. Remember that like you can't go down, right? Like after somebody is initially tested, their score is in the books. The only thing, uh, you, you can only benefit your score uh, because it's gonna be the, the max of the initial score and the retest score. Okay, so that's a broad prediction. There are some reasons why uh, that's not necessarily uh, the only strategy that's rational. But it turns out that we find this strategy in the data. So when we go look at the dates that schools chose, the prediction holds up, but it only holds up for schools that are under accountability pressure. So for the schools that are sort of most, think, who have a high proportion of kids who are failing the exams, and who might plot, you might think plausibly are thinking a lot about this, they're the schools that do exactly this strategy. Before the policy, they were setting their dates late in the window, when the policy starts, they set their dates earlier in the window. And do they go back after? Uh, I don't think we can do after. We had to like wrestle the the dates with like all all uh, thanks and credit going to one of my co-authors who wrestled out of the data uh, what the dates are that when people were giving there. Tests because they don't say anywhere explicitly in the data. Uh, and this is a table that shows those results, but I told you the basic story, and if you want to know the details, they're in the paper. So let me just wrap up with some big thoughts, and then we can, my big thoughts, my conclusions, and then we can have uh, some discussion, some further discussion. So what do I think uh, I tried to convince you of here? Well, first, uh, that I've shown you some evidence consistent with distortion of teacher effort across students. And that, that distortion was induced by the evaluation system. So the incentives inherent in the evaluation system, which, you know, are kind of subtle, but, you know, uh, we, have a, we have an incentive to figure out what the incentives are in our performance evaluations, we all do. Um, that induced people to, to change. So I think that would be not as interesting if the second point weren't true, right? Which is that the retested and the non-retested students near the cutoff, they're identical, right? They have equal return on teacher effort, they have equal claim on teacher effort, they would have equal weight in whatever social welfare function you have in mind. So this can't be, I don't think, that the policymakers set these weird incentives because they cared more about the kids who were epsilon below the cutoff in the pass-fail situation, unless you have some cynical definition of care. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that they necessarily <coughs> thought this is what they were trying to do. And that matters, right? That, so that allows us, because they have equal weight in the, the, so it matters for a couple of reasons. It matters for sort of an academic paper reason, because they have equal weight in the social welfare function. I can make stronger claims about it being distortion and not some sort of rational choice on the part of the teachers. But sort of from a substantive education policy perspective, it's an important reminder that like our choices about incentives matter, right? Um, which gets me to the last point. So sometimes in the education sector, you will hear people make the following claim. They will claim that teachers are perfectly motivated agents, that they're already doing what's best for kids, they're already making the best choices, and that we don't need evaluation because Whatever you do in evaluation, it's not gonna change their behavior. They're already making the right choices. I think that's a simplistic way of viewing human behavior. And this is evidence against that claim, right? Teachers did respond to the incentives of evaluation. And uh, because they did, hopefully that gives us some optimism that if we think more, uh, more carefully about what incentives we are giving uh, in the evaluation systems we create, that will avoid 
unintended consequences um, from evaluation. So, Eric, like, so it can't be the case that any distortion is too much. Like, so, so, it, 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 so, isn't it? I'm not saying there's evidence that it's true, but, but at least in this study. Yeah. But couldn't it be that because North Carolina was had this this policy that there were chunks of larger chunks of kids that were being pushed over the proficient you know threshold you know passing the test and that yes that like during this four year period where they had this funny test retest policy um, there was this Distortion that 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 popped up, Absolutely. Right. but it still could be that on net, so this is the kids cost. kids are a lot better off. I'm not saying again. I'm not saying we know that's true, but it's possible. Kids are a lot better off, and that even it, despite you know evidence of a, of a distortion. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and it's it's very hard to design a rule with zero distortion. Here they just sort of, with this test retest, they sort of created one. It, in some ways, it's a little bit harmless, you know, because like okay, some kids got a .03 boost. Um, you know, not much evidence that the, yeah. that kids were hurt. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I agree. Uh, it's a um, two thoughts. The first is that I agree that, well, I don't know if you said this, so let me just say it. It's hard to come up with a test, an empirical test, to measure whether all the kids in the state were better off or worse off. Well, I mean, that's what the D and Jacob, like, uh, school accountability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we would want to know, which is helpful, but we would want to know, like, and I take that as very encouraging evidence that yeah. on net, like, uh, as measured in the NAEP, um, that No Child Left Behind had some, some benefit. Um, in this particular case, we would want to know whether we got, whether the, the total benefit went up or down during when we added on this crazy retest thing. Yeah. We try as best we can um, with non, well-identified, non-quasi-experimental methods in the paper to, like, at least look to see whether kids above the cutoff were better off or worse off. It doesn't look like they were. So maybe it is the fact that everybody was, that the kids above the cutoff were actually no worse off, that the kids uh, below the cutoff got a little bit better in math. And that's not a terrible thing, right? I think that's fair. Um, in general, I also agree with the, the idea that, you know, some distortion in an evaluation system is sort of a cost of doing business, and we should evaluate evaluation. Sorry, we should <laughs> decide whether evaluation is a good idea or a bad idea by thinking about the total benefit. I totally agree. I guess I'm sort of focusing here on distortion for two reasons. One, well, I'm focusing here on, on this topic for two reasons. One is sort of emphasize the importance of thinking about distortion and empirically, uh, so other people have done that. Um, but also to like emphasize, I think we were well identified, perhaps relative to other papers, but um, but also to emphasize the importance that people actually do respond to incentives. So maybe like, you know, maybe we can't get rid of this cost, but uh, you know, when I try to put my optimist hat on, like maybe we could do better about thinking ahead of time about what incentives were. And maybe they were. Maybe the state said like, oh, this is going to be weird, but. It's going to help out on average. I don't know. Sure. I'm just trying to understand how I should understand the shift in the testing date. So yeah. the, if the kids who were right below the cutoff, um, the majority of them did well after the retake. And then the, the policy was to move the testing date up from early in the window to late in the window up to early in the window. 
Are those in effect the, the same kids who would have passed if it was later in the window because they're getting in effect the same doses that they would have if they had taken the test at the end of the window? Yeah, that's, I mean, I guess that's possible. Um, you're saying, imagine that we just kept teaching kids math uh, and we're just removing the data up early. Isn't this just, or, or are we just getting some effect from moving the data up earlier? I mean, you know, you in terms of in you, terms of you, like what the costs are for the school, like after the initial test, though, they can they can if they wanted to. I don't know if they. Did, but if they wanted to, they could just stop teaching math for the other kids because it's not going to change their. I mean, it looks very much like they stopped, which would be different from just continuing to teach all kids. You know, one one thing here that we haven't talked about today that often comes up is like, what were the if you believe me that the kids that it looks like the kids were getting taught more math in those two to three weeks, like, what were they giving up? Possibly they were giving up other things that we care a lot about, like art uh, or physical education or something like that. And maybe those things get more attention in the period after the test because the tests are done. Um, but, you know, so we could probably teach all kids more math, but that's not what happens here. Anyway. Um, sort of separate set of research questions, but maybe related to what Sophie was talking about about hydrogen effects. If you look at looked at sort of you know, their schools and districts, but also like you know, um, that would think gender would be like an interesting question, sort of equally distributed across schools and different effects in demographic groups. Like, where is this coming from? I don't the gender. Look grade by grade um, on the hypothesis that younger kids are less strategic about some of these things than older kids. Uh, after the initial, <clears throat> excuse me, after the initial test, do teachers um, get detailed information about um, sort of their students' performance, like yeah. where they um, excelled and where they maybe have particular Well, they get the scale score. You get a report with the scale score and the but like in terms of level. standards and I, um, actual test items. Not on the one that I saw. I mean, it's, it's possible, but not on the report that I saw. But this is a long period of time, and there are lots of school districts. Or anybody else who hasn't had a Yeah, I'm like right. <laughs> Tom and Sophie are very engaged, <laughs> as I would expect them to be. But if anybody else has questions. All right, Sophie. I, I, so I like have like a side interest in like what happens to distributions when you retest just statistically. When you what? When you select so like the mechanical effects of retesting, just oh, selectively uh -huh. like that. Yeah. And like 60% seems actually ballpark about what you would get if they didn't learn anything. Uh, and so I'm like wondering how like how much you think they learned. Like have you like sort of tried to disentangle those? I mean, it would seem unusual. I, I agree that if all we had was the retest, if the retest was our outcome, you know, this could just be uh, noise, right? But that's not our outcome, right? Our outcome is test scores one year later and even two years later. So I, I don't think that this is just. Oh no, I yeah, I don't think it's a threat to validity of your like actual effect. I just think it like. Oh, yeah. it's so like, on a good like, day, it's oh, like, like thinking about like how to interpret it. Like it right. actually isn't clear to me that they've learned a whole lot in those three weeks. Like the numbers you were posting up there are about what I would expect to have seen oh. mechanically. That you're interpreting the, the change in the, if yeah. we were to try to interpret, which someone might do, if we were tr to try to interpret the change from the initial test to the retest as a measure of learning, I agree. Like that's, that's not a, a great measure of learning because we're selectively picking the people who, uh, who did relatively poorly and we would expect there to be mean reversion like exactly. Yeah. Like, so I agree, but I'm not claiming that that's a measure of they how much learned, learned. That they were taught in those two to three, that the effect is from what happened in those two or three weeks. But I'm trying not to make that claim based on their retests. No, I know you're not. Okay. Uh, but I'm saying you can look at their retest scores, mm. say how much you would yeah. expect the distribution to change based on the testing. Yeah. 
Then I need you or Andrew as a co op. <laughs> model yet. But like my intuition from looking at a lot of like models of what yeah. happens to distributions is that yeah. what you posted there looks pretty similar to what I would have expected okay. with a baseline of like no learning. Okay. Which seemed interesting to me, but I actually haven't like popped yeah. your parameters into like yeah. my model. <laughs> yeah. And but you could, like these data are yeah, maybe I will. So, Eric, this is directly on this point. Yeah. So, like, um, but Sophie, like, wouldn't your prediction be that if somebody <clears throat> scored epsilon below the threshold, that if they learned nothing, 50% of them would have passed the next it time? It depends on where you're in the distribution. And so, if you're a lower down in the distribution, it's pretty low in the distribution. There, yeah, there's yeah. more error. Like, I, it's just so. Someone here. No, but his sixty percent thing was for somebody like right at. Yeah, and those right at the threshold. Great, right. and the people at the threshold because they're farther down in the distribution. There's more error on their test score than average because like. But wouldn't it be uh, symmetric? Like so, when they retake, it's like not, you get another draw. It's not symmetric because the like your prior should be that everyone has a median test score. Basically, think about it that way, and so people. In the lower part of the distribution, uh, like your belief about them is that they're more likely to have a higher amount of error in their test score than someone closer to the median. Uh, right. And so then when you redraw it, because you redraw it over here, where you expected the test score to have more error, uh, then like more than 50% of them are going to move over because there was this larger error component that you could play with yeah. than someone over here. Where you think they have less error distribution? So these data, so we have to stop there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> these data come from the North Carolina uh, data archive that are issue. and you know faculty and graduate students alike can apply to, to get a copy of, of the data. And you could do other interesting questions like this, or a hundred other things. Lots of papers have been written about North Carolina. So again, thanks. Uh, it was really fun to to play on the home court, uh, and. Uh, I'm around too, so if you want to talk more about this project or about something else, um, send me an email.